Good evening and welcome to Santa Clara University for our second presenter in this year's President's Speaker Series. In our series, we engage with the people and the ideas that shape our whole world. So we're pleased to welcome Mr. Jed York, the Chief Executive Officer of the 49ers. Mr. York's about to put our city on the map in yet a new way with the completion of the new Levy Stadium. So we're very excited to have him here. Uh, welcoming uh, our special guest this evening, I will be introducing uh, Kirk Hansen, who's going to lead our conversation with Jed. Kirk is the executive director of our Markle Center for Applied Ethics. He holds the title of the John Courtney Murray University Professor of Social Ethics. Now, the Markle Center is the nation's largest ethics center. It provides extensive programs in business ethics, bioethics, government ethics, internet ethics, and character education. The center also works closely with groups of business corporations, hospitals, city councils, and school districts on issues of professional ethics. Kirk uh, taught business ethics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business for 23 years, and he's now a senior uh, emeritus lecturer there. He's written extensively on the ethical and public behavior of corporations. In 2006, he co-edited a four-volume series titled The Accountable Corporation. He's consulted with over 100 organizations on managing ethics, and he currently serves on the board of the Skoll Community Foundation, and he assisted in developing the very first business ethics center in China. So we want to welcome Kirk Hansen. Kirk, welcome. Thank you. All right, good. Jed York is in his fourth year as chief executive officer for the 49ers football team. So over the past two seasons, the 49ers have triumphed on the field with a trip to the Super Bowl. And the team is riding high after a great win last week against the Panthers, and so we're cheering for the 49ers this Sunday, right? <laughs> Jed's plans for the new stadium reflect many of the same values we have at Santa Clara in terms of our own building and our own efforts. And this is in the area of sustainability. The 49ers are building the first LEED-certified NFL stadium in the country. Mr. York also helped make the team's new home a reality by securing $200 million in NFL support to make this a reality. So not only has he made the uh, stadium sustainable, he's also making it electronically accessible. The stadium will have one of the NFL's strongest wireless internet connections and will utilize software, including a mobile app, to provide fans with a paperless, cash-free game day experience. And the construction of all of this great stadium, I got to mention, is being coordinated and worked on by one of our own alumni, a number of our alumni, but especially Mr. Gary Filizetti from DevCon Construction. So Gary, where are you? Where are you? Okay, thank you. Good. In the community, Jed York serves as a board member of the Tipping Point Community, the Commonwealth Club, the Bay Area Council, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and the Council on Foreign Relations. He was born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio, and he attended a school in South Bend, Indiana. <laughs> where he earned a degree in finance and in history. You can do anything with a history degree, okay? So, and as, as I've been asked to uh, share with you, okay? Okay, so who's got it better than us? Nobody. Please welcome Jed York. Good evening. Hello, Jed. How you doing? Good. This is an opportunity for the Santa Clara community to get to know you. And so uh, much of what we'll talk about will be that. I, I first want to apologize that uh, none of the ticket requests from Seattle were able to be accommodated tonight. Uh, and we're glad to have you with us. Um, Thank you. Also, with Father Ng in that uh, uh, 49ers outfit, as I looked in the mirror as I was about to come on, I realized that you and I are both in uh, uh, black and silver, and this is not uh, the Oakland Raiders meeting, if that's what you were looking for. <laughs> All right. Um, you did grow up in the Midwest. You went to Notre Dame. Uh, 
let's talk a little bit about sort of what it was like to grow up and what your expectations were. Were you always thinking you'd end up in the West and uh, running a sports franchise? Um, so my grandfather was a real estate developer. He built shopping malls. Um, the 49ers were part of his overall business. And uh, my uncle ran the team for obviously a long time, did a great job. And when I grew up, I just knew that I wanted to carry my family's tradition in their footsteps. So I never knew if I was going to work here. I always wanted to work at, at my grandfather's company. And it was, you know, unique how this process worked out where my mother was running the 49ers and I was able to start working for the team and, and be able to go up. So it wasn't that, you know, I thought that I was going to run the team at some point, but I always loved the 49ers. I always wanted to be involved, but I never knew that that was ever going to be a possibility when I was mm -hmm. a little kid. There, there were two decision points. One, when you left the financial services firm you were with and came uh, to the that 49ers. That wasn't a tough decision. What? <laughs> Finance during the recession, 49. Well, anyway. Uh, it wasn't quite the recession, but you could see it coming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. And then, and then there was the point at which you did become chief executive. What made that the right point in time for you to take on that responsibility? Well, when I came out, I think I was 24 or 25. Uh, I'd worked for two years in New York, and my parents didn't want me to be for, sort of front and center when I just came out. And obviously, I was very young. I was very immature. I didn't know all of the, the ins and outs of the 49ers. And I remember my dad saying, you know, when you come out, you know, you're going to be working for the CFO who was heading up the stadium project at mm -hmm. the time, Larry McNeil. And um, he said, but that's 50% of your time. The other 50% of your time, you're going to rotate through all the different departments of the team. So you're going to work in the training room, the equipment room, you know, everything. And you're going to do every job in the building and learn everything. And I remember, you know, coming from New York and coming from Guggenheim Partners, it's like, yeah, sure, like, that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, you know, it was actually the best experience that I had mm -hmm. because you really got to see, it was sort of undercover boss, but I wasn't really undercover. <laughs> but you really got to see how everything worked in the organization, and it gave you a much better perspective you know, down the road and where I am now. So when you make a decision, you know how it affects literally everybody and everyone's job in the organization. Why were you ready at age 29? What, what were your parents looking for? What was your sense? Were you feeling ready? Um, I think I had earned the trust and the respect of, of the employees. And, you know, my parents still live in Ohio. My dad's here about 50% of the time. Obviously, with building a new stadium and trying to get the team sort of reorganized and reset in a position where we can compete year in and year out, I think my, my parents felt that we needed a, a presence that was here on a daily basis. And I think the organization sort of said it was the right time. I don't know if I did or my parents, <laughs> but the organization just sort of started looking at me as, as that person. Mm -hmm. And I think my parents saw that and they respected it. And, you know, it was... It was hard to do it because my parents didn't have a great relationship with the media, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to put their young son in a position where, you know, you're, you're essentially out there on your own. Um, but I, I told them I was ready for it, and, you know, I, I, I think I've done a decent job so far. And, and tell us what, you know, sports franchise has many different operations and as CEO you have to be the master of many of these dimensions. What was toughest to get ready for? What were the areas you felt you really needed to learn and were more difficult aspects of this job? You know I think the most difficult piece is really understanding football and you might be a fan, you might know that you know this player is good, that one's good, but actually understanding all the nuances and everything that needs to be right for a team mm -hmm. to be good. It's more than just having a good head coach or having a good general manager. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the position coaches that you need. It's, it's the strength and conditioning folks. It's how you work with your medical staff, understanding what the scouting system looks like and, and how do you make sure that you use analytics in a way that, you know, give you a little bit of an advantage, hopefully, over some of the other folks that are out there and try to figure out in a system where it's essentially like stock car racing, you know, you have a salary cap, everybody's allowed to spend the same amount of money, so how do you spend your money smarter and wiser? So understanding how all of that comes together, mm -hmm. it's, 
it's a unique process and it's not like any other business where you know you have a good fourth quarter and that carries into next year mm -hmm. if you have a good season it doesn't necessarily carry into next year everything starts fresh so you have to understand how how that tumultuous cycle sort of works mm -hmm. and and know how to put the right pieces together now your uncle took over the 49ers i believe at about the same age didn't he Pretty 28 close. or 29 Pretty close. is it a different world than when he took over the 49ers Yes and no. I mean, it's a different world in that, you know, the salary cap didn't exist. I think my uncle is one of the main reasons why the salary cap does exist. <laughs> um, you know, I, and I think that's, that's a big difference. And I think media is so much different today where anything and everything that you do is, is out there. And I don't think it was necessarily the case at, at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, when Bill started, you know, his first season wasn't a rip-roaring success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the second year, they were okay. They were getting a little bit better. And in today's NFL, if you have two losing seasons like that, we've seen coaches get fired after two seasons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after he fired, I think, at least two, if not three coaches before Bill, mm -hmm. and then you start off with two wins, and then you go to seven wins, and then the next year you win the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. you know, obviously it paid off. But it's, it's a different world when the media is on you literally 24-7 mm -hmm. you know, to make a change and do this and do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think he was very helpful with me to just say, you know, you know what you want to do. Don't listen to the noise. Just go out there and do it mm -hmm. and trust in yourself. When you took over, the 49ers were in a slump. Uh, how was the pressure at that point? Was that a particular part of what you felt? I think pressure, pressure allows you to to be more free. You know, it, it, at that sense, yeah, that, at that time, we, we didn't have a ton of success recently. Obviously, the 49ers had had a lot of success in their history, but nobody really expected anything from us. And when expectations are low, you know, the, the pressure wasn't like what it is now. You know, now mm -hmm. our fans expect you to get to the NFC Championship game. Mm -hmm. They expect you to get to the Super Bowl. They expect you to win the Super Bowl. That wasn't the case in 2010 when I became the CEO. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they hoped to get back to the playoffs. And I think now we've got the team back where our fans expect us to be competing in mm -hmm. January, hope that we're going to be competing in February, and really want us to be there. And, and that's, that's where the team should be. Now, uh, in an uh, item that's quoted often, you either got ticked off or very strategically said to a reporter, uh, we're going to make the playoffs this year when things looked pretty dark. Yeah, we were 0-5, and Singletary was our coach. We ended up going 7-9 and that year and missed the playoffs. 7-9 or 6-10, and I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But we missed the playoffs by, like, a game. Yep. And then, obviously, the next year, we hired Jim. You know, you go 13-3, and and you're the number two seed. And I, I can see the pieces starting to come together. And, you know, to me, Mike Nolan doesn't get enough credit from the media or from our fans. He really set a foundation, and he taught me more about not necessarily the X's and O's of football, but the personalities and the people in football and how to build an organization. Mm -hmm. And you could see that we weren't that far away from being able to compete and get to the playoffs, and that's, that's why I felt comfortable that that's where we were. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're going to be for a long period of time. How do you hire a head coach? Do you personally get involved as a, a top executive? Is, uh, who, who makes that decision or what group of people make that decision? So my parents are obviously the owners of the team. It's not like I just get to go out and tell them after the fact what happens. <laughs> um, but, but they gave Trent and I the ability to go out and, and put the search together. Trent Balky, who is our vice president of player personnel, and I promoted a general manager. He had worked with the 49ers since 2006. Um, you know, a, a great personnel guy, understands football inside and out, had been a coach before, was great on the college side, which is very important when you're trying to evaluate talent, understood really the, the nuances of the game, understood the salary cap fairly well. So when we let, you know, that process start of who to look for when we were transitioning from Mike Singletary, you know, we, we knew that we wanted – Jim, he was our number one candidate. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of other folks that we liked. But it was one of those things where it had to be the right fit. And if you remember, at the time, Jim was, you know, suited by many folks. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of teams that wanted him. And, you know, the way we positioned it with Jim was, 
you know, you're here, you like the Bay Area, your family likes the Bay Area, this is a team that's poised, that's ready to win, but if you don't want to be here, then we just can't make that commitment. And I think everybody else, you know, and I, I know this now, my, my wife gave birth to our son, he's about 15 months old, and it's not the easiest process when you I, have I a I was going to ask whether he was ready yet to become CEO he, of the 49ers. But. I, you know, <laughs> I hope it's sooner rather than later so I can go back to enjoying games. But with Jim, you know, his wife had just had their second, and they were preparing for the Orange Bowl. And obviously at that point it was a great season in Stanford. It's still one of the best seasons in Stanford's history. And we said to him, you know, there are other teams that you're looking at. You know, your alma mater, other NFL teams. Talk to them. You know, make sure that this is where you want to be. Because we have, this has to be a partnership. This, there has to be a trust that's built between us. And we want you to look at all your other opportunities. Mm -hmm. We think this is the best one, but we're not going to twist your arm and make you do it. What, what leadership traits in a coach make the difference in their success? So you have to be able to command the room. You have to be able to, to get 53 guys to follow you. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the biggest thing is you, you can't have any fear. And I, I mean, that, that's, that's the thing that I try to explain anytime I'm talking to students, anytime I'm talking to anybody. As a leader, you can't be afraid to fail. And greatness only happens if you're not afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what you see in Jim. He's, he's willing to go out there and leave it all on the field. And he's, he's willing to go do whatever he has to. And if he loses, he loses. But that never enters his mind when he, when he steps into competition. Let's talk about the move from San Francisco. Uh, one of our other uh, uh, loyal alumni besides these in the room is Gavin Newsom, and he hasn't been as happy with your decision uh, to move down. He's getting uh, better. To move, he's, he's getting, getting better. better. So what, what does it mean for a city, either San Francisco or Santa Clara and Silicon Valley, to have a major league franchise like this? Well, I, I think first, when you look at the 49ers, we've, we've always been a regional team. And when, when Patricia Mahan was the mayor at that time, when we looked to change our focus from San Francisco to Santa Clara, I mean, she said essentially on the first day, you know, this is the San Francisco 49ers. Like, they will have Super Bowl parades on Market Street in San Francisco. We'll, we'll, we'll host games here. We'll be a piece of it. But this is the San Francisco 49ers. We've said that consistently from day one. And I think when you look at the relationship now between Mayor Lee you know, Mayor Matthews, and even with Mayor Reed in San Jose, those three came together to help win Super Bowl 50. Bring it to the Bay Area, and it's not just bring it to San Francisco, it's not bring it to Santa Clara, it's not bring it to San Jose, it's bring it to the Bay Area. And I think the more that we can work together as a region, and I really, really strongly believe that sports teams do more to cut across barriers, you know, erase boundaries, and bring a region and bring disparate portions of people together. I, I don't think there's anything in the world that does that like sports teams. Mm -hmm. And I think the 49ers have done a great job. I think the San Francisco Giants, when you win two world championships, you bring an entire community together. It's not just San Francisco. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all of us in the Bay Area. Everybody was rooting for them. When you look at the Warriors, how great they're doing. You know, the A's had a great season last year. You see all the things that people are doing. It, it brings an entire community together. And yet there were many people here in Santa Clara who opposed the stadium and, and this move. Why, why does a community oppose it? Why were the people so adamant here? Well, I, I mean, we won by a 60 to 40 margin. Okay. So anytime you can win, you know, <laughs> by a three to two count, that's, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good election for, for anybody and anything. Yeah. And I think when you look at the unknown, everybody's afraid of the unknown. And I think it was a good thing that we had, maybe not a huge opposition, but we certainly had a vocal opposition mm -hmm. in Santa Clara. And we tried to address their concerns. It's not like we came in, I mean, we started this process in 2006. We're not going to open the stadium until, you know, August of 2014. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty long period of time. When you look at development in California, it's actually a short period of time, mm -hmm. but it still allows you to get the perspective of everybody and make sure you can listen to opponents who might never be for your project, whether mm -hmm. it's a stadium or something else, but I think those opponents allowed us to have a much better project and a much better process that will allow public-private partnership between the 49ers and the city of Santa Clara to last for decades to come. What's the short version of why uh, a city like Santa Clara 
ought to want a professional sports team. What are the benefits to having the 49ers here? Well, th there's economic benefits. You know, there's the benefit of, you know, being seen, you know, and, and being on the map and those mm -hmm. types of things. But, but ultimately, it just makes your community a better place. You know, when, when you look at, you know, providing jobs for thousands of people, especially at the time when we started where there weren't a lot of jobs out mm -hmm. there. There wasn't a lot of construction going on in the Bay Area at that period of time. When you look at Santa Clara that, you know, they're not a huge city. It's about 100,000, you know, residents in the city of Santa Clara. We're going to add significantly to the public coffers. We didn't take from the public coffers. We didn't increase taxes. We didn't impact the city's general fund negatively. We're actually positively impacting the city's general fund. You know, those are things that make your community a better place. And I think what we've been able to do is unlock some of the things that have been sort of hidden in Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. We've got great infrastructure. You know, if you look at the development that's going on there, there's a lot of new, you know, development that's going on. There's a lot of new office buildings that are going up in and around the stadium area. So those are things that it might not necessarily be the stadium itself, mm -hmm. but the stadium certainly helped unlock that. And especially for Santa Clara, where you look at 90% of your residents on the other side of 101 from where the stadium mm -hmm. is going to be, and, you know, infrastructure that was built for peak.com traffic, it's, it's the perfect location for a football stadium, especially in a relatively urban area. So what's a stadium built today like? How is it different from a stadium we might have built 20 or 40 years ago? Well, it has to be flexible, and it has to be, you know, and I, I say this, not trying to be disrespectful to any of the other stadiums that have been built, but bigger is not better in California. Smarter is better in California, especially Northern California. When you look at Silicon Valley, when you look at what we've been able to do with some of the great companies that have been founded here, you know, it's, it's always pushing the envelope and, and getting smarter and getting more efficient, getting better. Mm -hmm. Our fan base and our community just takes that for granted. They expect that to be cutting edge. So with the 49ers, what we wanted to do was be a software-driven stadium, a smarter stadium, not something where we put a ton of hardware in. But, I mean, if you don't have a, you know, a cell phone, if you don't have an iPhone or an Android phone, raise your hand. <laughs> so we've got like four people out of 400 that don't have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a part of life in Northern California. We wanted to make sure that you can connect to the stadium through your own device. You know, so we wanted to make sure that whether it's ticketless, cashless, being able to watch replays, being able to order concessions to your seat, being able to order concessions to pick up, you've already got a device in your hand that works. We want to make sure that not only does it work well in the stadium, but it works better in the stadium than anywhere else that you can use it. And we've got not just an app, but a technology stack that we're building out that connects all of those systems together. So one stop shop with your, with your you know, personal phone, your tablet, those types of things that allows you to really connect to the stadium and integrate to the stadium unlike anywhere else in the world. Now, if you don't want to use that, you can still use a ticket, you can still use cash, you can still do those types of things. And you can still have, watch the game. You can still watch the game, <laughs> but, but when, when we've been testing what we're trying to do at Levi's Stadium at Candlestick this past year, you know, you'd be shocked at the folks that were sitting there watching replays five seconds after they happened on their phone, and the folks that were sitting around them, how they, you know, just come up and see, you know, where'd you get that? How, how did you order hot dogs to your seat? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And it allows you to actually enjoy the game more. You don't have to waste 20 minutes going to the concession line. Mm -hmm. You know, you can look and say, okay, wow, you know, the restroom lines are red right now. I'm going to wait. The restroom lines, you know, three, three stalls down, they're green, so I'm going to walk over there. It makes it a much more efficient experience, and that's, that's what you want. Fascinating. You've, um, the publicity over the new stadium has made a lot of, to do about sustainability and use of solar and other things. Can you give us a sense of what you've tried to accomplish and how successful you've been at it? So we wanted to make sure that, that we built off of the foundations of Santa Clara, of the Silicon Valley, of the Bay Area. And, you know, being environmentally conscious is very important. It's very important to the 49ers. It's very important to our fans and our constituents. So we decided that we wanted to not just be green for green sake. We wanted to be functionally green. So our stadium, the way it's built, the majority of the energy, we've got our, our suites stacked for the most part on one side of the building. 
that's really where the most energy usage takes place. So instead of having energy usage take place all the way around the stadium, it takes place in about a third of the building instead of half of the building. So you can shut that down and you can focus your energy much more efficiently. When you look at the green roof on top of that you know, sweet tower, it's not just let's throw some solar panels up so we can say we had solar panels. You know, solar panels are part of the design of the building, but it's also a green roof that's going to have natural vegetation to Santa Clara, that's going to be a place where a thousand people can go and watch the game. If you've ever been to Wrigley and been to the apartments across the street from Wrigley, imagine that type of experience, but actually inside of the stadium and in a place that allows you to have a LEED certified building and allows you to be net neutral to the grid for our home games. That's a pretty big accomplishment, but it's something that's functional. And that's really the key. It's not just green for green's sake. It's functionally green. Uh, the uh, uh, securing of Levi's as the stadium sponsor was quite a coup. What, what does Levi's get out of it? And uh, does that serve your interest to have that kind of a company? I mean, we say it, and it, it's sort of a, a, a pun, but it's, it's really the perfect fit. You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you look at the original 49ers, you know, they turned to Levi's. You know, from, from a tool standpoint, from, from the jeans when they started in 1873. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, th there's a huge connection and correlation between the original 49ers and the original Levi Strauss company. Mm -hmm. So when you look at having a company that is synonymous with the city of San Francisco, you've got the San Francisco 49ers. I think not only does it connect us back to the city of San Francisco, mm -hmm. but it allows us to have a partner that you know, really can do some cool, interesting things and, and really connect with not just their consumers, mm -hmm. but their thousands of employees, a lot of them in the Bay Area, but worldwide, and say, you know, this is, this is our brand. Instead of just, you know, we have a commercial that's going to run for six months and then, you know, not sure where it's going to go, this is where, you know, you can see Levi's every Sunday and, and tens of millions of people are going to be watching it every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have the ability to build out campaigns in and around the football season mm -hmm. and know that there's going to be dedicated advertisement and dedicated time after you see a 30-second ad to go hear somebody say Levi's Stadium 15 times in the next, you know, segment during a game. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of synergy there. But, I mean, it ultimately comes down to their CEO, Chip Berg, gets the NFL. He was at Gillette when they did the, the deal with uh, the New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. He understands how to make these types of deals work. And, you know, you've got somebody that not can you just pick up the phone and call, but you can just drive to their office or right down the street. You can go see them. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a great relationship, and I think it's going to be an unbelievable partnership. And they paid some money for it. They did. <laughs> and, I mean, you know, I, I think the nice thing for both parties, you know, we could have certainly asked for more money. Mm -hmm. And Levi's is a great fit because they don't, they don't knock out any other partners. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't knock out a beer or a soda or this technology company. They fit in and, in and of, of themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were able to pay probably less than what market value was. But because we were allowed to keep all of our other partners together, I mean, it, it ended up being a great win-win for both us and for Levi's. Uh, one of the criticisms I've heard of the stadium, of course, is the cost of seats. And what would you say to those, uh, even amongst your long-term seat holders, who are worried about being priced out or who have felt they've been priced out? So I'll just ask, what do you think the conversion rate has been from candlestick to Levi's stadium? My guess is from your comment, it's going to be exceedingly high. <laughs> it's, close to, it's close to 80%. Mm -hmm. And when you look at a normal turnover, for us, just on an average season, it's usually somewhere between 85 and 90 percent. Mm. So the transition from, Levi's, from Candlestick to Levi's is essentially the same as what we have turnover every single year at Candlestick. So, you know, there might be folks that were upset about prices, but it certainly didn't show up in terms of who is going to new, the new Levi's Stadium. What else will the stadium be used for? So we will have... Our first event, which is going to be uh, the Earthquakes versus the Sounders, there's going to be a lot of soccer. Um, we'll have a lot of concerts in there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, those are the large events. You know, you'll see, you know, 10 to 15 major events every year at Levi's Stadium. But then you'll see, you know, smaller things like this. 
You know, you have a couple hundred people. It's a great, unique space. We're going to have a lot of spaces like this in the building. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a lot of those types of things. So people will be in that building 365 days a year. It's just not going to be 70,000 people that are in it 365 days. We don't need quite 70,000 for the President's Series. Maybe for the Ethics Center's events. Maybe. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Super Bowl, 50th Super Bowl. Big decision, big win for, uh, for you. Uh, uh, what, what does that bring? What, is, what does it bring to the franchise? What does it bring to the community to host the, the 50th Super Bowl? Well, I think having the, the golden anniversary of the Super Bowl in the Golden State is, is very powerful. Mm -hmm. The first Super Bowl was in California, and the 50th Super Bowl is in California. So when you look at the next generation of the NFL, they're coming back to California. They're starting it here again. And, and I think Levi Stadium will be a stadium that really is, is the model and the template for other venues worldwide for, for a long period of time. Okay. So when you look at that, when you look at having you know, millions, hundreds of millions of people watching a game that takes place here, you're going to have hundreds of millions of dollars spent in our economic region from you know, as far north as Napa mm -hmm. to as far south as Carmel. I mean, and everything in between, it's going to be an unbelievable event. And if the weather's like it was today, when it's, you know, 72 degrees in January, <laughs> you know, that's a pretty nice day. I think what you're going to see is if we can put together the type of experience that I expect from the Bay Area, I think you'll see us on the circuit, mm -hmm. you know, very consistently, and we'll be able to host this game many other times and hopefully attract other large events. You know, WrestleMania is coming next year, mm -hmm. and, you know, that's going to bring hundreds of thousands of people from, I think it's like 50 or 60 countries that they expect folks to come for WrestleMania. And it's going to be a great event, and I think you're going to see a lot more of those happen. Mm -hmm. Let me just remind the audience that we're going to be collecting cards from you uh, with questions for Jed, and I'll be asking as many of those as we can get to. So if you can be writing those down in about five to ten minutes, we'll switch to your questions. So uh, please uh, be doing that. Uh, Let's talk about some of the problems of professional football uh, at this point. There's been quite a bit of discussion, obviously, and legal suits and settlements around the problem of concussions. How does, how does that issue affect uh, your family as owners uh, and the policy of the 49ers? Well, I think the 49ers have always been on the forefront of, of health and safety. My father is a physician by training. There aren't many other physicians that run professional sports teams and own professional sports teams. So my dad is actually the chairman of that health and safety committee. And I think what you're seeing now in, in, in professional sports, especially in the NFL, you're seeing folks start to understand head trauma much more than what they did in the past. And I think you're starting to see folks, you know, you'd have never seen somebody come out of a playoff game because they got, quote, unquote, dinged. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's partially because we didn't know a ton about concussions and partially mm -hmm. because, you know, players weren't very forthcoming. They didn't want to come out of a game. Mm -hmm. You're starting to see more and more folks take care of themselves and take health and safety much more seriously. And I think we're going to continue to make our game safer. Um, I think we're going to continue to improve the equipment that we use to make the game safer. But the more we can continue to study, the more that we can continue to monitor and make sure that you, know, you take that tough decision out of a player's hand and it's really in the hands of a doctor, I, I think it will make the game much, much better in the long run. The, the doomsayers say professional football's days are numbered because of fear of the, the collective impact of concussions or uh, uh, on the individual brain. Uh, do you have any fear of that as, as owners, or is there a way of preparing for that possible scenario of, of I, serious uh, concerns? I think the NFL, more so than any other sport, has done a great job of <clears throat> continuing to change and adapt the rules annually. Mm -hmm. And I think we will continue to do that, and we will make the game something that you know, folks want to participate in. And I think the more you understand that, you know, and this is something that my wife and I didn't know, and you start sitting down, you start doing the research, more kids get concussions playing soccer as youth mm -hmm. as, as compared to football. Mm -hmm. The most dangerous thing to do for kids is riding a bicycle because mm -hmm. there's a lot more accidents, there's a lot more collisions, there's a, a lot more of, of head trauma that happens from that. And that's where you see, you know, first of all, doing your research, doing your homework, and understanding what, 
what's mm -hmm. out there and what's possible. But I think it's how do you take that to the next step and make sure that football can be as safe as possible and, you know, kids can have a fun, enjoyable time experiencing the greatest game, I think, in the world. Mm -hmm. as, as you probably know, uh, the university has established an institute for sports law and ethics, and the 49ers are one of the sponsors of that, which we're very grateful for. But it's a partnership between the athletic department, the law school, and, and the ethics center. <coughs> Apropos your comment, two years ago we had a panel on concussions and football. This last year we had two panels, one on concussions and football, and then another on soccer and concussions. Uh, and so there was a broader exploration, exactly as you described. Uh, what about violence in the game? Um, uh, the commissioner has stepped in very strongly on questions of violence in the last couple of years. Uh, is that a, going to be a continuing headline and, and a continuing problem? I don't know that it's going to be a continuing headline because I think Roger's done a great job of saying, you know, we're going to take hits to the head out of the game, mm -hmm. period. And I think that's a very important step. And I think when you start teaching the fundamentals and showing that, you know, a helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit, you know, even when some calls we might think go against us, mm -hmm. I, I think for the long-term health and safety of players and for the league, you, you need to take that step. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a, a controversy around the whole subject of movement from colleges to NFL and the, the use of colleges, almost uh, college football, almost as a farm system for the NFL. What do you see in the future uh, in the relationship between college football and professional football? You know, I, I think they are separate and I think they should be separate. I, I don't think it's just a farm system. You know, mm -hmm. kids should be getting an education. The NFL isn't responsible for providing an education from a university standpoint. Mm -hmm. But I think when you look at the NFL, you know, we won't let you come into the league until your high school class has participated for three years in college. And I think that's something that, you know, is above and beyond what any of the other sports do and the age that players are actually coming in and becoming professionals. And, you know, I think you see a big difference. It might not sound like a big difference, but you think about the difference between an 18-year-old and a 21-year-old. You know, that's, that's a pretty big jump from being you know, a kid adolescent to really starting to become an adult. And I think you see a lot more maturity in NFL players, I think, than some of the other younger athletes that go into other sports. Uh, does that mean that we ought to consider some kind of limits on uh, jumping to professional sports uh, uh, earlier than uh, four years of college experience? No, I, I mean, I think the way the NFL does it is appropriate. Mm -hmm. I don't think you want to hold anybody back from being able to go, you know, try to advance their career. Mm -hmm. And if you're a junior in college and you decide that this is your career path, you know, you're, you're an adult. You can go do that. And I think that, that makes sense. Those guys at that point are probably physically able to go and make that leap. But it's hard for a kid coming out of high school to go into the NFL. And I think that's where you would end up getting into more of a, of a you know, baseball system where you have a minor league. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know that you necessarily want to go there because I think it's very valuable for kids who go to school. Mm -hmm. um, and what about college athletes? Should they be paid so, to throw uh, out a controversial issue? That, you know, uh, I mean, you can argue right now that they are paid when, when you're getting, you know, a scholarship to go to school. Mm -hmm. And I can certainly argue a lot of different things. Thankfully, I'm not in a position to have my argument mean anything. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I remember just when I was in college, you know, at Notre Dame, we had, you know, football players They, they, they the play dorm. professional football there, don't they? Well, they, they used to. They don't anymore. <laughs> um, you know, one of, one of the kids on the team was a, was a buddy of mine and, you know, lived like literally across the hall, you know, with my parents and their affiliation with the 49ers, they couldn't bring him to dinner when they came up to see me. And it's like, you know, I don't really think like taking a kid out for a steak dinner when it's a buddy's parent, mm -hmm. I, I just don't think that that's a huge egregious, you know, thing in college sports. I, so I think they can be a little bit more lenient. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, there's, there's a lot of gray area, and I don't think there's one simple answer, and, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the problem with it. Let's, uh, as, as my final topic with you, talk a bit about uh, the game this week. Um, it's on how does one, how, how, how does the team prepare for uh, this kind of a, a 
conference championship? You know, we've been there the last two years. I think we have experienced it that hopefully will help. But it's, you know, you, you can't let the moment become bigger than what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think Coach has done a great job getting the guys focused. You know, we've been on the road the last couple of weeks. We've got to be on the road in, you know, probably the most difficult place to play in all of professional sports. And we have to transcend that. We have to find a way to beat the odds, beat the elements, beat the crowd, and, and, and beat an unbelievably sound, good football team. Mm -hmm. and, and what about the, the accusations that the sound system is manipulated, the uh, access of the crowd, access to tickets is manipulated? Uh, how, how do you regard that? I, I don't. I, I mean, I, I think it's... It's just something that's there. People can talk about it however they want. We just need to go play 60 minutes of good football mm -hmm. against a, a, a very good football team. What does it mean to the 49ers uh, to win that game and get to the Super Bowl? Well, I mean, that's, that's the goal. I mean, the goal isn't to, you know, win X amount of games or do this or to do, do mm -hmm. that. You know, our goal is to get to and win the Super Bowl every year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is the next step. And... You know, we'll, we'll find out if we're ready for it on Sunday. Um, l let me ask a bit about the economics of such a game and, and getting to the Super Bowl. The economics of, of professional football is, I gather, geared very much around the television rights uh, and that that, in many ways, is much more important than, much more important than, uh, than w other sources of revenue. I don't know if it's more important. Um, it might be a larger stream, but I would certainly argue that at Levi's Stadium, if you don't have 68,500 people that want to come to a game mm -hmm. and make a great atmosphere, then I think it's less valuable for television. I think it's less valuable for advertisers. I think it's less valuable for sponsors. So I don't know that television is more important, but it might be a larger revenue stream. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the 49ers, when they were in a slump, was that an economic slump, a financial slump, as well as a... Um, I mean, Candlestick was record. not a, a great building for, I think, fan experience and from a business and economic mm -hmm. standpoint. But we understood that Candlestick had a finite life and that we needed to get to a new stadium. Mm -hmm. I think we'll be more competitive with a new football stadium. Mm -hmm. But, Thank you. you know, ultimately... There's, there's not a huge difference because everybody's allowed to spend the same amount of money. We've always spent to the salary cap mm -hmm. and we'll continue to spend to the salary cap. Mm -hmm. um, did you have in mind that you not only would end up in the West but also marry a Bay Area woman when you were growing up? I just want to uh, compliment you for that uh, decision. <laughs> I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with marrying a blonde haired girl from California. You know, I, I think that's everybody's dream. All right. Let me, let me start the questions, and I'll hope, I hope they'll bring me some more. Levi Stadium parking. Parking is a major issue for any kind of a venue like that. How did you think about parking, and, and is the problem solved? So the, the problem is solved, and you know, if, if you read or saw what happened last night at the Santa Clara City Council, you know, we'll have close to 30,000 spaces for, for our football games, which is 50% more than what we have currently at Candlestick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Thanks. The, the parking at Candlestick, you've got 8,000 stalls that are right there close, and then the rest are in the dirt lots and, you know, not the easiest place to get in and out of. We'll have a much more functional plan for parking here with a lot more spaces. And I think the biggest thing is we've got access to real public transportation. So we have as many season ticket holders that live in Sacramento as what we do in the city of San Francisco. So when you can take the ACE train from downtown Sacramento to the Lafayette station and walk four minutes to Levi Stadium, I think that's going to make it a lot easier for our fans that are coming from Sacramento and coming from the East Bay where the ACE train runs through uh, the Coliseum site. I think there's going to be a lot more folks that use public transportation, not to mention folks that you know, are close to the light rail here at the University of Santa Clara you can jump on the light rail and you can be there in 15 mm -hmm. minutes. And of course the person also wants to know how many EV parking spaces there are going to be there for the stadium. So we're still working on some of those to, to get more dedicated spaces, but there will be a lot of EV spaces 
and we will continue to experience and expand that number as, as we get the right partners and we, you know, it would be very helpful to see how the first year goes, mm -hmm. but I, I don't imagine that EV cars are, you know, electric vehicles are, are going to decrease over time. Mm -hmm. um, it's a couple of questions about leadership. Uh, you said greatness only happens when you aren't afraid to fail. Um, uh, do you feel you're uh, more willing to fail at this point? Can you describe uh, uh, perhaps one of your own failures that uh, uh, you've been able to take in stride? Yeah, I mean, the first decision that I made was hiring Mike Singletary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of folks, when you're young, when you're in a position of, you know, power or whatever you want to call prestige mm -hmm. as the president of the 49ers and then the next year the CEO, they want to defend a decision to show that they, they didn't make the wrong decision. And I love Mike. I think he was a great linebacker coach for us. He was a great piece of building some of the guys, especially mm -hmm. Vernon Davis and Patrick Willis. You know, he did a great job building those guys up, but he wasn't the right fit for us in the long run to get us where we needed to be. And, you know, it, you can say it was a failure, but I think it was just, it was a learning experience. And you can either choose to try to cover up and fix a mistake, or you can move on from it. And, and I think I did the, the latter, and mm -hmm. I, I think it turned out okay for us. And uh, the other has to do with your relationship with Jim Harbaugh. And uh, it's phrased as, what's, le what's one leadership lesson you've learned from watching him? And what's one leadership lesson you hope he's learned from you, watching you? Um, we have very different styles and personalities. <laughs> um, and I think that's something that's very important. When you're building out a team, you know, it's easy if you're starting a, you have a startup out of your garage and it's you and your best friend from college, your roommate, like you guys, you're in sync with each other, you're in harmony, you know everything that you're going to do. But when you start building out an organization, you can't just hire people that are the exact same as you. And Jim is somebody that always pushes to get better. And sometimes that frustrates people in an mm -hmm. organization. For me, I've learned that he is such a driving force, and you have to let him be himself. And you have to make sure that he understands what the goals are of the organization, what, what the organization means, and he absolutely does, but he does it in a much different way than I would do it, and I respect the way he approaches his job every single day. I respect the fact that he's always pushing me to get better, and you know, he'll make it uneasy for people in the building. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way you continue to improve, you, you have to feel some level of uneasiness, because anytime you're complacent, then progress doesn't happen. Progress stops when you're complacent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's no complacency with Jim. <laughs> you can see that on his face as you watch the sideline. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, th this is another question about the stadium. Would the 49ers be open to the Oakland Raiders uh, playing there uh, and being a uh, co-tenant? So that was something that we had always talked about from the beginning, uh, the possibility of having a second team never called out specifically what a second team would be, mm -hmm. but that's what the voters of Santa Clara voted on. And, you know, to this point, nobody has ever reached out to us about being a second team in the building. Okay, so the, for the uh, Raiders have not reached out to you is a specific question. Here. Nor anyone else. Nor anyone else, all right. Um, uh, <laughs> also about the stadium, uh, is uh, there going to be some good food better than at Candlestick uh, in the new stadium? So we thought it was very important to keep the restrooms and the concessions exactly the same as Candlestick in the new building. Um, so, so everything will be exactly the same. <laughs> now, I, I, when you're in the Bay Area and you have access to, I think, the best produce, the best culinary experience, the best wine experience probably in the world, we want to make sure that we capitalize on that. We want to make sure that we use as much local organic food as possible. Um, you know, my wife and I have been doing food tastings for the last probably 12 months, and we're trying to get to a point where, you know, you'd feel very comfortable bringing your kids to a game and letting them eat, you know, a, 
an organic, locally grown, all beef, natural hot dog. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's where we're getting to is, is really reinventing food and concessions for a 68,000 seat venue. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I can't wait to see how everything works and functions on day one. Great. Great, and you'll be able to order it all on your, your uh, cell phone. Be able to order it, either deliver to you or order to pick up. Okay. Um, here's one out of left field. Does your wife like football, too? She loves it. <laughs> all right. Well, she good. loves football. Was she a 49ers fan? Absolutely. All right, good. She's okay. a UC girl. She went to uh, Santa Cruz, so she, she grew up with, you know, not a ton of football, mm -hmm. you know, at, at Santa Cruz, um, but she's she went to she went to Giants. We won't go there. She went to Giants games with her dad, um, and and she went to Niners games with her dad, and you know she's she's a huge fan. Great. A couple of questions uh, about careers in sports management. Uh, what uh, advice would you give to students here at Santa Clara or at other places that say, uh, you know, uh, is what should I do to get into sports management? Well, I mean, whether it's sports management or anything that you're passionate about, you know, don't be overly concerned what your first salary is out of school. You know, I, I, I understand that it's not the easiest place to live in Northern California on, you know, a, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars salary that that might be your starting salary as you know in a sports team. But if that's really what your passion is, you know, just suck it up and go for it. Like, find a way to make it work. You know, we have, you know, a bunch of folks that have done a great job. I look at Prague Marate. Prague Marate, who's our chief operating officer right now, you know, he started off as essentially an intern working for Bill Walsh. Mm -hmm. And he worked his way up from that point from putting together models on the salary cap and draft and things like that to, you know, essentially running our, our business and, and sports analytics departments for the 49ers. So it's, it's very possible. You just have to be passionate about it. And if you are, whether it's sports or whether it's something else, if you're willing to work, it's, it's not about what you make when you're 22 years old. You know, it's, it's starting a, a long process of what do you want to do for your career. And if, if it's worth it to you, you'll, you'll find a way to make it work. A related question, are you currently hiring with an email address for the student who asked the question with a request to give it to you? All right. Uh, so that we'll, we'll reach out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, we've, got a couple, we've got a couple more minutes uh, uh, and hopefully uh, a couple more questions. Um, Really, it, it had, there, there are a couple of questions that had to do with next year, top draft picks, uh, and you know, how you plan for the following year, coming off a great year, as this hopefully will be once again. Well, I mean, I, I think that's where you have to build out the right organization. Trent Balky has done a fantastic job Thanks. You know, acquiring talent for the team, both through the draft and through free agency. You know, Jim has done a great job of developing talent you know, that has already been there and guys that we've brought in. So I, I leave that completely up to those guys. That's not something where I spend a lot of time or, or really waste their time with my uh, non-opinions or non-valid opinions. <laughs> how, uh, another area that, that was suggested was how long someone who at 33 already has as much experience as you do uh, running the team uh, being CEO, how long do you stay in this job? Is this a lifetime job if it, uh, if it continues to be as good as it has been? If my stomach holds up from, from Sundays. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine doing anything else. Is there a lot of stress in the day-to-day, -day or do you nope. feel... just on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a fun experience to watch a game with me. It's okay. just not. Last question is a very self-interested one from Santa Clara's standpoint. What, what can we hope for in a partnership between Santa Clara University and the 49ers? We, we clearly uh, have participated and supported the, the stadium and uh, uh, hope that we can have a deep partnership. What, what's your sense of what's possible? Well, I mean, I think, you know, you see some of the folks that are working with you, like Hannah Gordon, mm -hmm. 
um, you know, things like our just proximity to Santa Clara. You know, it's, we're right down the street. It makes it a lot easier for us to do things and partner mm -hmm. with you because of the proximity. And I, I think it, it's going to be a partnership that continues to grow and continues to evolve. Um, you know, I, I won't put too much pressure on, on Father, but, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to have a football team. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that, that was for the Notre Dame remark, so we're, we're even. But, I mean, I think when you look at the 49ers being here, you know, folks do miss football in Santa mm -hmm. Clara. Now, now the football is back in a way where, I don't know if everybody understands or remembers, but, you know, Buck Shaw, who was the first coach of the Niners, was, was a coach at Santa Clara, and the 49ers' first uniforms are actually old uniforms from Santa Clara. So I think there's a great connection there. And I mean, I think when you just look at the natural ties, there's a lot of things that we can do together. And I think we have two willing participants to try to figure out mm -hmm. how to do more. Great. And, and really, the final question, Father Ring uh, announced this afternoon that uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama will be here on February 24th. Your, your honorarium will be a, a ticket to that oh. event. Uh, <laughs> If you had the opportunity to ask one question of the Dalai Lama, what would it be? So I, I did have the opportunity to ask a question. <laughs> um, and what I would say for folks that are in the room, if you have the opportunity to see him speak, um, jump at the opportunity. And I don't know if I'd necessarily say that asking a question, because he will answer it much differently than what you expect. I would just try to take in his presence and just see how he approaches everything and, and, and you start to see that the small things that we might worry about just really aren't that important. And I mean, you can see somebody that is truly at ease with himself. And I think it's a great example for all of us in all of our days. And hopefully I can take some of that with me for three hours on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jed, for Thank being you. with us. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Are you Thank you very much. <laughs> Here? All right. Well, that's great. Thank you. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Father. Good to have you here. Thank you, Jed, very much for your presence here, and we'll look forward to developing that partnership. Uh, I didn't get a skybox. <laughs> so uh, thank you all very much for your presence here, for your participation. Look forward to uh, celebrating when we bring back football to Santa Clara. Thank you. <laughs>